Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media, I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at the Sentry Tower. This is all part of the game Atlas Empires which you can find out more about in the links in the description and this is just one set of many that I'm making for them. There's a playlist in the description if you're interested in how I made any of the other sets and throughout this video I'll be talking about tips and tricks and how I made and painted these models. I'll also be trying to answer your questions that come in in the comments so if you have any questions for the next time then do comment below. So here's the concept art for this piece. These are made by Chris Handlauser and he's an excellent artist. I think he uses ZBrush to make the models and then I think he draws over them in probably Photoshop I think. So here I am in Blender and you can see that I've just imported models from the previous scenes. So I found similar objects and imported them. I will actually bake the maps across to the texture map that I'm using for this particular set. So for each set I use a 512 by 512 texture and all the models um, all their textures have to fit on that one map. And I do rebake these uh, particular models because they slightly change sometimes and I like to adjust them according to the environment that they're in. And you can see that I'm now modeling all the shapes and I keep it in that sort of look dev mode uh, so I can see the bits that I've already made and the textures that I've already made and just how they're going to sit together. I find it just helpful. And you can see me reducing some of the polys there as well. So trying to keep the polygon count low, I do talk about that all the time, but as low as possible uh, so it doesn't go crazy, the lower the better. Some people have actually asked me, is there a polygon count? Well, no, there isn't. I went quite high on one model and I contacted them saying, uh, look, I'm worried that this model's going too high. And they said, no, that's okay. So I kind of know the boundaries that I'm within. But no, they haven't given me a specific polygon count. I think they just want me to get it as low as possible, uh, looking as good as possible. That's pretty much my, what my brief was. So for things like this rope, for example, that's going around these posts, you can see that I'm trying to reduce the polys, but keep that sort of circular look and all the detail I'll be painting in. Now I had a question from Dan on YouTube and he was asking about scaling and whether these follow real world dimensions. Well, actually, the strange thing is they haven't asked me about scaling at all and I just sent them the models and did just sort of generic scale, uh, didn't worry about it too much. And I think the case is that you can bring these things into something like Unity and then you can create your prefabs from there. So you scale them to how you want them with the rest of the models. So I imagine the case is that they're getting lots of art from different artists and it's probably all different sizes. So they will have to adapt and sort it out so it fits the scale of their game. Uh, so they'll have to do all that in Unity anyway. I have been asked that question before actually and it did make me think, I wonder why they didn't ask me for a specific size, but they didn't so I just uh, give them these sort of random sizes. They are all pretty much the same because I follow sort of one blender grid unit. Uh, so they're all about a, a meter or something like that, two meters I think it is or whatever the <laughs> size is. So they're all roughly the same and they'll resize them in Unity. Another question that Dan had was about the UV unwrapping and keeping the UVs to the correct size. And I think what he means by that is uh, when you unwrap, uh, you want it to be kind of relative in size. So the small objects only take a small part of your texture map up. Now, this is a really interesting question and I haven't really found a solution. And actually, I've been caught out by this a couple of times. Generally speaking, when I unwrap, it's absolutely fine. And they do kind of represent the, the model's size on the texture map. So if I unwrap the whole set, uh, then the different objects, uh, if they're big in the set, then they'll take up a big part of the texture space. If they're small objects, then they'll take up a small part. But only recently, I found that that's not actually the case. I, I thought that Blender kind of did that naturally, especially if you uh, reset the scale of your objects, that it should come out naturally. And I, maybe it does, in fact, and may, I made a mistake recently, but I had a one small object that was taking up a big part of my UV texture map, and I didn't spot it until quite late, and that was really irritating and frustrating. But it should be, and I thought it was the case, that if you reset your scale for all of your objects, then it should look a blender should look at the size of your object and then unwrap it accordingly. So an interesting question. I'm not sure if I've got the answer right there, but if your scale's set to one, uh, then it should hopefully unwrap relative to the size of the object. The other way you can check your unwrap, of course, is to uh, put on a UV texture grid and you can sort of make an image and put it on everything. 
and just check all the sizes. But that is quite a laborious process for something that really ought to be automated. Uh, so hopefully, uh, maybe the community out there, maybe some people know about this and they can get back to me on that one. Do comment in the description. It's very, very helpful actually. I've had lots of suggestions about things and certain shortcuts that I had no idea about and they've really helped me out. So thank you very much to all those community members out there that do offer solutions to things. It's also worth reading the comments from that point of view because lots of people are asking uh, similar questions so you can just have a look at the comments and I do obviously look at all the comments and I try and respond to all of them especially if there's a question in there of some sort. Speaking of questions Dan has a third question and it's about the color map and this is another interesting one and Dan's question is about the colors that I'm using and whether they're going to fit in with the other artists who are using different colors in the game. And it is correct that I'm not the only artist working on this. The lead artist, Chris, has sort of talked me through uh, what sort of style, and uh, I had to do a kind of test run. So I did one of the sets and they said, uh, yes, that's exactly what we're looking for. Uh, luckily in my case, uh, they were happy with it. And as I've been going through, Chris has asked me to change a few things. Some are a bit bright and some I needed to up the contrast and things. And he generally has the eye for whether things are matching up or not. So he can see the whole project and see how it's working. But yes, I suppose I'm surprised there wasn't uh, more of a color palette, but this is the first uh, game that I've worked on in a team. I've worked on lots of other different models as the only artist, as it were. So these things are quite new to me as well. The way I make sure that my models are matching up with each other is by just importing the color map that I use from the old one into the new project. So you can go file append, go to the palettes, and then append the palette in, and you can just pick the palette up, which is nice and simple. It's also worth saying that you can probably see some of the objects uh, look a little bit strange, occasionally anyway, uh, it, more so later on. But occasionally I'll bring an object in, let's say it's an object that I've used before in a previous set and it doesn't quite fit in but I'll actually leave it the same size and don't worry too much about it because at the end when I've baked the texture then I'll remake the object using edge slide and I'll probably add in a few bits and pieces or whatever but I can then use that bake to already make half the model so let's say it's a big beam of wood and I want it to be much shorter I can obviously just scale it, but in this case I don't want to stretch the textures, so I can just sort of edge slide uh, the ends across and then redraw the ends if I have to, or maybe cut it up and redo the ends. So let's say if it's a beam of wood and it needs to be sort of like those pencil uh, chopped ends, then I can reuse the beam of wood, bake the textures, and then slightly remodel it. Yes, that will distort the textures slightly, but when I re-unwrap those end pieces, then I can just repaint those rather than having to paint the whole beam itself. But you have to consider the time it takes for all the baking uh, and whether that's worth it or whether it's just quicker to sometimes paint it yourself. There's certain times that I will actually force myself to repaint something. Uh, so if it was uh, something like metal, and I'm finding metal quite a struggle because many of the textures are repeated or mirrored and the reflections that you kind of paint in and fake look rather odd. So sometimes I'm kind of forcing myself to repaint them to practice and get good at painting the metal. And the baking process isn't a particularly easy one anyway, so it's actually sometimes just easier repainting. Now I've had another question from someone who's calling themselves computer science, and they were asking about whether to use Auto Smooth and Mark Sharp. So that's where you can make some of your models smooth and some of it sharp as the name suggests of course. Uh, so if you have something like a cylinder, that's a classic example, and you don't want all the edges around the outside to be sharp, so that's where, let's say it's a, a baked bean can and uh, you've got the label section, uh, that bit you want to be quite smooth, but obviously the top and bottom you want to be quite sharp, and that's where something like Auto Smooth comes in. Well actually no, I don't want to use that in this case because all the sharp edges are painted on, and I know that sounds a bit strange, but um, the whole models, all of them, I will set to smooth. Uh, and it's actually shaded through the painting. So any sharp edges, uh, you just highlight with a paint stroke. Uh, you don't actually use hard edges uh, when you're rendering hand-painted objects. 
Dan's also asking about UV unwrapping and if I can do a more complex and detailed tutorial about that. I'm happy to do that if lots of people ask for it, so do comment below if you want to know more about that. I have done a recent tutorial about unwrapping. It's very basic though and it's a beginner's tutorial, so perhaps a more advanced one would make sense. I'll probably do some character modeling once I've finished with the Atlas Empires project and then I'll talk more about detailed unwrapping there. And Dan's also saying that when he does the um, automatic unwrap, which is the smart UV project, that's when he's getting lots of problems with the different sizes, uh, which is interesting as well. And it could be, again, about setting scale, but it can be a real frustration. And I had no idea why my map that I was recently doing, uh, one of the small objects turned out big. I really don't know what's going on there and whether it's maybe a bug in Blender, perhaps. Dan's also asking me questions about uh, whether I could show the export into Unity. Well, the only bit that I use Unity for is just to check that my models are working. And sometimes I actually forget to do that and they're sent back because I've made a slight mistake somewhere. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm just sending these off as a OBJ file and they're sorting it out their end in Unity. In terms of uh, joining, I think he was asking about uh, joining uh, the mesh together. Well, I just, each model, I just join it together and put the object center at the base. Uh, so I put them all in the center basically uh, and then send them off and uh, that's all I do. So it's just control J and join them all together. So all the modifiers and things like that, I uh, do a quick select all, convert, uh, was it curve to mesh or whatever it is. Uh, and that gets rid of all your modifiers. I make sure there's no link duplicates in there as well by just setting the relationships and turning them all off so they become individual objects. And then I just join them all up and so uh, I'll only have 10 models at the end of it, even though they are all separate bits. The reason I'm using separate bits all the time is actually more for uh, the uh, modular approach so I can repeat certain aspects. It's also a lot quicker to model rather than trying to make it all one shape. You just sort of model in type, kind of boxes in a sense, box modeling as it is. I sometimes use planes as well and model up from a plane. But generally speaking, like I am here, I'm modeling in a box kind of way. I've also been asked if I can share the concept art. I do need to speak to Chris and see how he feels about that uh, because it is, is his work and the team in fact uh, they might not want to uh, share it but they seem to be quite open and I think it's a good thing to be open about those sort of things because it's a great way of uh, sharing your product, getting people interested and they seem very open to that. They've got quite a, a forward way of thinking I would say in those terms. For the most part, I'm trying to remember to show the concept art at the beginning so you can see uh, what I'm working from. And you could just, if you're desperate for it, to take a screen grab from there. Uh, I think some people are trying to sort of follow along uh, with me doing this sort of modeling and things, uh, which is great. Uh, it's nice to see people trying these things out. Um, obviously, there would be a copyright, so you can't use that in your game because the designs are actually copyright but if you just want to try it out I don't really see that there's a problem with that but that's not my call so don't quote me on that. <laughs> I do still get the odd question about uh, whether I'm using a graphics tablet uh, and yes I'm definitely using a graphics tablet I'm using a display tablet the Mobile Studio Pro. I st I'm still very pleased with my Mobile Studio Pro I think Wacom do certainly have the edge when it comes to uh, display tablets. I tried out an XP pen uh, recently it was the artist pro and I was really impressed with that but just when you get to the corners it's very slightly out whereas the mobile studio pro and the Wacoms don't seem to have that problem uh, it's a very minor thing but uh, when you're doing this every day it makes a difference if you're a uh, beginner intermediate and maybe even a pro that only uses it sometimes then I'd go for the XP pen but I would certainly recommend the display tablets over the normal graphics tablets. I mean, obviously you can't really do this uh, with a mouse. I suppose you could, it would just take you absolutely ages. Uh, but uh, it's tougher with a graphics tablet than it is a display tablet. There's not a, as big a jump as there is from a, a mouse to graphics tablet, but there's a bit of a jump from a graphics tablet to a display tablet. And it's more about when you uh, are trying to do a stroke that's going across uh, or up and down. It, sometimes you turn your paper when you're drawing, but uh, you can sort of turn your arm on the uh, display tablets, but you can't do that on graphics tablets because you lose your orientation to the screen. So it's just little things like that that make quite a difference uh, with the display tablet. It really does help tremendously and it will speed up your workflow if you do get one. 
Now you can see when I'm modeling these shapes, I've actually got a, quite a quandary a lot of the time about when I'm going to use the mirror and when not to, because obviously using the mirror, I can't add too much character detail, so dents and chips, uh, because they'll be repeated. I can get away with a few, uh, because if they're right on the other side, then you don't notice that they're repeated. But occasionally, especially for circular things, I'm mirroring across the X and Y axis, and there you can't do any character elements at all, which can be frustrating, but I feel like it's important to keep that texture space because it is a really tiny texture space and you can start to see some of the pixels when I go really close in. So you can see me here painting rope. I have a detailed tutorial on painting rope, so uh, do check out the links in the description. I have a playlist to the different techniques that I use uh, for texture painting. So have a look at the playlist if you're interested in any of those. I do go into detail. And if you want to see any particular part in detail, like how did you paint the spears, for example, uh, then I can break that down easily enough because I've got all those files and I can talk through it in more detail. But generally, I'm just sort of giving an overview with this sort of time lapse here. And generally speaking, I keep it to about 10 times. Uh, but I don't always include all the work that I do. Sometimes I'm staring at my screen looking for reference images and the screen's just sitting there blank. So occasionally I forget about those and leave them in. So if there is a sort of blank bit where it's just looks like I'm sitting there doing nothing, that's when I'm looking for reference images of something that I haven't painted before or something that I feel like I need a bit more guidance on. And reference images are essential. Uh, I still look at reference images for things like wood and rope and so forth, even though I've painted them lots of times, just because there might be a tiny technique that I haven't really tried, and I, I always want to advance as an artist. So I'm trying different things occasionally, not too much, because obviously this is a project where I'm trying to keep um, the continuity going between sets, but occasionally I'll just try a small different thing just to see how it works. And sometimes it doesn't work, and then I'll sort of scrub the bit out and start it again. But I do need to develop myself as an artist, so that's important to me to do. You can see the color palette on the bottom right here, so you can see uh, the fact that I've appended it in. It's got lots of different colors there. And generally, the, each set kind of has a color theme to it. So in this case, it was a red theme, although you can see that my canvas here is green. So later on, uh, once I've baked the texture on, I change that color to a red. And that's using the color blend mode for the fill mode. Really handy that. I do like that blend mode. It's a brush blend mode. And you can change it to color and just change the color of things really easily. And look at that, bang on time. Uh, there's me changing the color of the top sheet there. So I've baked the texture on and now I'm changing the color slightly. It's a bit tricky with this because it didn't change it exactly how I wanted and I had to go in and change this that patch there. So that patch is repeated quite a lot. Hopefully that's not too much of a jarring eyesore that it's repeated so much. Uh, but I quite like that patch. I think it works nicely. It sort of makes it look more canvassy, I would say. Another thing that I've talked about before, but I'll mention again, is the fact that I go from an emission node to the principled BSDF, and I have this in look dev mode. The principled BSDF is so I can see the edges, and that's why I keep it on the sort of hard surface shading rather than smooth. Sorry, not hard surface, but flat shading. Therefore, you can see the edges really easily. And then at the end, I say shade smooth to everything, uh, and that gives me the final image. But I need to be able to see that flat shading so I can mark the edges. When I don't want to see it and I want to see what it's going to look like in the final result, I'll go back to the emission shader and that's with the node wrangler. You press control shift left click on your uh, texture node and it gives you an emission which is actually the final result and what it will look like. When I actually render these out, I do cheat really slightly. I put some ambient occlusion in there and I put some lights and then that's when I use the principled BSDF slightly. But I put the roughness all the way up, the specular all the way down, so it is very rough. It just is affected slightly by the light and you get a few shadows. You can also use the ambient occlusion uh, input node as well, so that's kind of handy. Now here you can see me moving about the UVs. I can't actually remember why I needed to do this, but there was some sort of reason. So I'm uh, creating a space for some UVs. I think I forgot to leave a space for a roof. So I thought the concept art repeated those um, log pattern, but it was actually a new shape, a new sort of wooden, uh, yes, wooden slats 
instead of, uh, not tiles, but sort of wooden planks as a roof. And I'd forgotten to model that, and I just had the wooden post instead. So I had to try and create some space on my UV map. And that's kind of bad practice, really. But the only way to get around that is to rebake your whole map uh, once you've unwrapped every object. And you have to set new UVs for every single object. It's a real pain. So uh, that's actually why I'm not using plugins like the UV Pack Master. I did think about it. And weirdly, it didn't work for me. I think there was some glitch in my version of Blender at the time. Uh, but that really packs all your UVs in really tightly. It's really good because uh, you can utilize all the space on your UV map. But the problem is you don't get any room for maneuver. So if you've made a slight mistake, you can't make up the space anywhere. And it's really awkward and difficult. But because I've got a tiny bit of space, I'm able to readjust some of the UVs around the place and put an extra object in, which I had to do just here. In terms of the texture painting, it's uh, always the same technique. Uh, so I do a sort of very rough sort of colors and they're very random colors to uh, give variation in the texture. And then I sort of fill in the shaded bits. So much like you're drawing on a piece of paper, you fill in uh, the shading with your pencil. And then uh, after that stage, I do the highlights, which you can see what I'm doing here with the highlights for these pieces of wood. Uh, then a bit of character. And in this case, I thought a bit of color on, or color variation anyway, on some of the planks. I just like that. I think it gives it a strange sort of natural look. You know how uh, different beams will be affected by uh, rot or light in different ways, so, um, and different parts of the tree. So different color uh, is important in my mind. You can see me using the principal BSDF for this particular one and cutting up the tiles here, and I need to be able to see where the edges of those tiles are. And I could have actually uh, done just a plane here and uh, drawn in the shading uh, for the tiles, but I actually did model uh, the tiles in this case. I think it looks better. Some of my earlier models, I tried to do uh, tiles with a very flat roof, and it just didn't have quite the same character, especially when it came to the edges where the tiles meet the wood. Uh, it just looked odd trying to shade in some tiles when there wasn't a real bump there. Uh, so I wanted to actually uh, model that in as well. So you can see uh, I've gone back to the emission node now. Uh, so once I've got those highlights in and the shade in, I can then add the character with the emission node in and you'll see the final result. And then I'm just adding a bit of color variation again. And it does, I, f I feel like that color variation makes a big difference and works in my opinion. The very last thing to do is then just to uh, shade it up uh, a bit more so the top is a bit brighter, the bottom parts are a bit darker, so just an overall shade. Also I sort of zoom out and look at the other objects and make sure the colours are matching. And you can see what I did with the roof just earlier, um, I actually uh, did a slight fill multiply on it so it went a bit darker to match in with the previous planks that I'd done. So uh, when I'm painting I don't generally use isolation mode much. Uh, because I need to be able to see the other textures to make sure that I'm matching up. I'm obviously using my color palette as well, uh, but it's nice to be able to see the other pieces of wood around and make sure they're all matching up with each other. A couple of people have been asking about the release of the game. It is apparently early next year, so I'm very much looking forward to that. I was very excited when they showed me some of the pictures of my models in the game. I think I've mentioned this in previous episodes of this, but uh, it's just great to see your work actually uh, how it's meant to be shown and it's just a, a real delight uh, and you really feel like you've made it when you can see your models in game. I haven't really got to see that much. I have done game models for people before but uh, this time I actually saw my work with lots of other artists peop and people's work and they were actually sort of playing and testing out the game and it was very exciting to see. So you can see for this plank I've gone into isolation mode and I know I said I don't do that much but I only had to do it here because there were so many objects around this particular plank and also I needed to use the whole plank even though only half of it's seen in this case but it's one of those planks that I'm going to rotate around in different areas of the model so I wanted to model or paint the whole thing and then use it across my model but can you see how that is now a different colored wood to the rest of it because it's so easy to kind of painted a different color when you can't see the other objects and I've then highlighted uh, and used a multiply on it or whatever it was to try and match up the color so 
It was either a multiplier or a screen slightly, or maybe even just a bit of a colour blend mode as well with the fill brush. So some more roof tiles here. I quite enjoy the roof tiles, I don't know why. I think it's just uh, creating the illusion of depth is quite fun and uh, I feel fairly confident with it. Uh, so it's a nice thing to paint. Uh, it's strange that really. You have your favourite things to paint and roof tiles is one of my favourites. I think there's tiny details with it as well and I didn't use a mirror on it so um, I can go to town with a bit of character and that's what I really enjoy doing. I think now's a good time to say thank you to all those that uh, keep watching all the way through to this distance and it's really nice to see when you, there's a comment saying I'm still with you and so forth so please comment below again uh, saying I'm still watching. It, it, I don't know why but it, it makes me happy that uh, my efforts at this stage uh, aren't kind of going unnoticed and it's just really nice to hear from those people that are watching uh, to this stage, those sort of die-hard fans who are really interested in texture painting and uh, watching me paint some wood. <laughs> and thanks to all those that just write a comment saying thanks uh, or a heart or whatever it might be, thumbs up. It's nice to see, I really do like getting those comments and it keeps me going uh, because sometimes it's, I suppose, is it lonely doing a channel like this? In a way it is, but uh, it isn't lonely when you've got lots of people uh, saying well done and uh, love your work and stuff. That really helps uh, and, it, and it makes me keep going with the channel and be excited about the channel and things. So uh, I really appreciate all the comments that I get. It's fantastic. So here you can see me painting bricks and I do have a detailed tutorial about uh, painting bricks. So do check out that playlist if you are interested in uh, the different techniques in detail. Um, I, I quite like painting bricks as well. It's another one where you can put a bit of character in. Although this shape is mirrored, I think, across the X and Y. So it's a little bit tricky. No, it's not the X and Y. It's just the X axis because it's different at the front, isn't it? Uh, but uh, that does make it difficult to do any character pieces where the mirror's close to each other. Uh, so it's not too bad uh, when you go opposite sides of the mirror because they're not going to be seen at the same time. But you can see that when I'm drawing lines occasionally, uh, they look uh, really odd and symmetrical. Uh, and you've got to try and keep away from that somehow, which is a bit odd because it is a mirror. <laughs> it sort of makes sense. It's also quite tricky to paint on a mirror because that bit down the middle doesn't get painted the same as the bit on the edges. And uh, it's difficult to explain why that is, but it just is how it is. And you have to sort of kind of get used to that uh, but, and get your brush really small so you can paint that middle line. Uh, generally it doesn't matter too much, uh, but uh, you do have to watch out for those things. Uh, but mirroring textures saves an awful lot of texture space. You can imagine uh, it can halve the texture space of an object, obviously. Uh, so you can see, there we go, I've done a bit of character. Um, on the opposite sides of each other is fine, but I did some at the front there, and you could kind of see the mirror a little bit. Um, so you might notice that. I don't think, uh, there's tiny elements of character uh, that you can put in, and when I say character, I mean the, the scrapes, the bumps, and the nicks and things. So yes, you can put tiny bits of those character elements in, but you do have to be careful watching out for uh, the symmetry and how it looks. Uh, generally speaking, uh, when there's lots of other things around it as well, so this is in isolation obviously, uh, but there's uh, the bits and pieces hanging off this building so you can get away with a fair bit but yes you do have to watch out you can see that just that last stage there I like to um, that's something I learned re more recently I suppose is uh, just darken the ed the bottom parts and lighten the top parts and it just gives it that illusion of depth and you can see me adding the slight variations in the color to the stones uh, which I like doing as well and yeah, that gives it that sort of uh, distortion around. It's very difficult though when you've got a mirror on, as you can see there, it's obviously mirrored, uh, so it's a little bit awkward. Uh, but it just about worked, so um, I kept it in. But uh, that's why I don't do too many character elements uh, in my models, because of that mirror. Occasionally people are asking me about uh, working uh, with a team and for a game company and what's it like as a freelancer and so forth. I'll probably do more about that later on as uh, a blog. But if you do have any specific questions, then I'll try and answer them in these. In a sense, it's, there's not much to say really, as I was kind of just contacted through my YouTube channel and they were interested in the fact that I obviously could promote the game as well as doing the artwork, so they're excited about that prospect, uh, which I think is a good marry up. It's nice to have a YouTube channel for that aspect too. Uh, but in a way, I'm just uh, sort of doing the models, sending them off and uh, occasionally getting some feedback 
about uh, changing a few minor aspects. And, uh, but generally it's going really well and I'm really pleased with uh, the communication aspect uh, and working with this uh, fantastic team. I feel like it must be hard from their point of view because uh, taking on an artist, uh, you've only got their portfolio to go by and uh, you don't really know how well they're going to be in terms of communicating with them, whether they're going to fit in with your workflow and do they understand things like game optimization and so forth. Uh, so uh, they might have looked at my models and uh, thought that's great, we'll have uh, that person on board, but um, I might have been making them with really high polys or something like that. Uh, so uh, they, you're always ha going to have to take a risk on artists to a degree, uh, but I suppose uh, you can quickly see whether it's going to work out or not. And lucky for me, it's working out really well. I think that's really important as an artist that you have to uh, be a good communicator, uh, ready to uh, take criticism and feedback and just work really hard. And I think we all have that sort of perfectionist side to us if we are a game artist. We all want to our work to be the best it can possibly be. So having that feedback and criticism is actually really helpful for achieving that. And obviously you're trying to uh, work with the team and get the best possible game. And the better the game is, the more chance I have of getting more work at the end of it. And it's the case that if you do a nice job and they're happy with you, then they'll want you for the next project because they don't have to take any risks then, they know exactly what you're producing already. So I imagine it's going to be the case that I'll get more work with the people that I work with more often. It's one of those strange things, often people are asking about how you get into the industry, but once you are in there and you're working for people and meeting new people and uh, getting along with people, uh, then they'll happily re-employ you, as far as I understand it anyway. So you can see I'm doing these sort of metal bits now, and yes, they are mirrored, so I have to be again careful of the repetition in the character elements, so those little dinks in the metal, which are really common in this sort of art form and this sort of style. I have to make them quite small uh, because if they're big characteristics, they'll be noticed in the mirror, uh, so I have to be a little bit careful. So this sort of metallic element is quite tough, especially, like I say, when you've got a mirror, because uh, generally metallic is drawn through reflections, and that's kind of what makes metal metal is um, sort of how reflective it is, especially and if it's brushed metal it's not too bad and this kind of looks like brushed metal I suppose but if I want it to be shiny in any way then I need to be able to think about the reflections and so you pretend to put reflections in by having dark and light spots but as soon as you have a mirror on it then the dark and light spots are repeated and it just looks really odd so you just have to be a bit careful. So you can see me doing a bit of a tidy up around the place and I think I cut some of this out because it can be really tedious. Uh, but I just go through resizing things and cutting off faces that aren't necessary. Anything that's sticking out as well. And you can see uh, you can do an edge slide and it doesn't uh, affect your UVs. So you can uh, grab an edge, press GG to edge slide and the UVs will stay in place. And I think that's a really nice uh, feature and it makes things really easy. And you can see that I'm doing it here. So there wasn't too much to do there, I think, but uh, a fair bit, I suppose. Uh, it's always good to go over and double check everything. So there we have it, the Sentry Tower in all its different iterations. Thank you for getting all the way through again. Thank you for your, all your support. Remember to comment below and uh, let me know of any questions and then I can try and answer them in the next few episodes. I am working on my website as well, so if you have any suggestions for that, then do let me know there. Also, remember the playlist in the description and Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.